Welcome everyone to Couch Potato Diary. Happy Friday, my name is Pierre Klein. Thank you very much for tuning in today. A lot of NHL playoffs to talk about, a lot of NBA playoffs to talk about, some baseball as well. Uh, if you're looking for more face-punching talk, that's going to be on part two of the episode today. So we have a lot to cover, I've already rambled too much, let's get into it and start talking about another classic game from the National Hockey League last night. The Edmonton Oilers with another impressive performance, this time against the Dallas Stars in Game 1 of the Western Conference Final, winning 3-2 in double overtime, uh, thanks to a game-winning goal from who else? Connor McDavid. And he was excellent last night, and the whole team was really, really impressive. I absolutely loved what I saw from the, the Edmonton Oilers in this game last night. And look, like I, I know, I, I said, um, I put the clip out on social media yesterday um, that I, I felt that the Oilers were going to have to play perfect to beat the Dallas Stars. Some of y'all got real upset about that. Um, and, oh, well, how did this go? It's like, I don't know, they won game one in double overtime, man. Like, I, I still think the Dallas Stars are a pretty good hockey team. Uh, but Edmonton looked like a very good hockey team as well. And it all starts with Connor McDavid, who was excellent in this game. He factors into everything, um, setting up the, the first goal, setting up the second goal, scoring the third goal, that ends up being the winner. But he had complete control of this hockey game. And he's going out there against Chris Tanev. And that is not an easy matchup to win. And most don't. But he was great. Like I said, he scores the winner. Really good setup on that first one. Coming off of a penalty kill, um, where, like, the, the, the penalty kill was great, again, for, for Edmonton in this game. Um, sorry. Say hi to Shiloh. Say hi, Shiloh. Hi, Shiloh. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um cat sitting him all right but no like he he was he was great and like that that first goal coming off of a penalty kill where they're they're building up some momentum you put him out there you, you bring out the the McDryman line and they dominated and he ends up setting it up where they're able to to get that goal and this is coming at a time where they didn't have a whole lot going on this was uh, a couple minutes into the second period and they had three shots and uh, that got them going. And then a quick counterattack on the second helped set up uh, a Zach Hyman goal. And then he ends up scoring the, the overtime winner. And when you look at it for Connor McDavid, this could be a legacy defining series for him. He hasn't made it past this point. He is facing an excellent team in the Central Division champions. If he can lead this team into the Stanley Cup final, this will be one of the defining series, at least in this part of his career. Um, and, and one of the ones that, that we remember him for. Um, and I, I do really think that this is a, a, a really, really big moment for him. I was on 960 today. Um, and they asked like, does he need a Stanley Cup to, to, to cement his legacy? And like, for most guys, no. Like, but there there is an area that he wants to be discussed in, or that he, he's going to be discussed in, where you kind of need a little bit of bling to make your way in. And um, if he can, if he can lead them there, that this is just this is going to be one of the ones that he gets remembered for. But it wasn't just Connor McDavid. A lot of the depth pieces stepped up. You have Fogel with the breakaway chance, where he kind of stick handled his way out of it. But I, I thought Fogel was fine. Um, Evander Kane, I thought, was all around the puck in this one and and really stepped up in that way. Um, you, you have Evan Bouchard and Ekholm come in, and they looked really good again in this game. It was all systems go for the Edmonton Oilers, and quite frankly, in a game where I thought that um, Dallas entering it was the more complete, more balanced team, Edmonton looked like the more complete, more balanced team, and that that was able to th that showed up in them eventually getting the edge in shots and eventually getting the edge on the score clock. And then also, um, it was Skinner who stepped up in a big time way as well, and I thought he had a huge game. He looked he he looks back he looks back to normal. He looks comfortable between the pipes. He made some key saves. And um, he was able to, to stay composed when the puck beat him. It hits the post. It comes out in front. If he is back to normal and if he is back to being able to maybe stealing games, I'm not going to say he stole this one because I do think Edmonton was the better team. Um, but if he is capable of stealing games, then this team really rockets forward and comes up in a, a, a like, conversation as a, a, a threat and a favorite to win the Stanley Cup. It's just, it's so much fun to watch this team play right now, 
on the Stars' side, Heiskanen, um, he was buried in game one, or buried, if you actually like to say words correctly. 14.7 um, expected goal percentage in game one. And if that's going to be the case the whole series, they, they are just, they are simply going to lose. If Miro Heiskanen is getting just throttled in that way, then this is going to be a very quick series. For Edmonton to win the high skin in minutes so aggressively is a gigantic win for them. And look, I'd be surprised if that was the case the rest of the way, but they need him to step up because he's not even getting the McDavid minutes. No, it's, it's, he's not even getting McDavid. He's just getting Tricital, um, which is how, how insanely talented the, the top part of this Oilers lineup is. But for, for the Tricital line to bury... Heiskanen in that way and then have McDavid go up against Tanev and Lindell and they, they won that too uh, not by as wide of a margin but it, they, they they ended up winning those minutes five on five as well it is really tough to get going for 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 Dallas they, they need Heiskanen to be the difference maker in this series and to be the guy who can step up and and come up with big plays like we have seen throughout these playoffs. And so if he is getting just his head beat in that way, this is going to be a really, really long series. And so Dallas, with the matchup edge in in game two at home, I wonder how they go about it. And if there is kind of a counter, if Dreisaitl is continuing to give high, um, uh, Heiskanen, sorry, that much of a problem. But it was a lot of the kids that struggled for Dallas in game one. Uh, they, they need more from Johnston, uh, from Robertson, and, and from Heiskanen. We, we just talked about the defenseman. Um, Robertson gets the chance in overtime on the power play that hits the post, but it took him a while to get going. And I, I do think that that is first time in the Western Conference Final. The You can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You start to grip things a little bit tight and all of that. I am assuming they got that out of their system, and they're going to be a little bit more comfortable now going into game two, three, four on down the line. So I am I'm expecting Robertson to be a little bit better. I'm expecting Wyatt to be a little bit better as well. And for, for the Stars team just in general to look a little bit more comfortable out there in game two. But the Vets, they had no problem. Dodonov stepped up, Ben stepped up, Sagan stepped up. That cycle game that they were able to play was just simply tremendous all, all game. And they're going to be a real key going forward. If they are able to continue to do that um, and the kids start to get going, again, that's going to provide a bit of an issue for Edmonton. But the, the Oilers countered in a way I wasn't expecting, and they look really, really good. We'll see if the Vets can can kind of keep it up. Pavelski also, I didn't mention him in there, but Pavelski, I, I thought, played a good game. And then Ottinger was just fantastic. He, he can really steal games in this series. Um, and it seemed like he got better as, as the game went on. This was such a fun hockey game and is going to be... So such a fun series to pay attention to. Um, I, I can't wait to, to watch game two. I already wish it was tonight. Like, I, I wish it was over so we could just binge watch it right now. That That's how good this was, and that's how excited I am for this series. But alas, it has a day off, and we get ready for game two of the Eastern Conference Final. I think the Rangers will be ready for the Florida pace and strength in this game. I, I think that that kind of caught them off guard in game one, and again, the moment Although this is a bit more of a veteran team, the moment did seem to get to them a little bit, but they they seemed a little bit overwhelmed by how the Florida Panthers played. And I do think that they settled in a little bit, but the turnovers ended up costing them. I think they're going to be a little bit more adept and a little bit more prepared for what Florida can throw at them in this game. And again, I was on 960 earlier today, and uh, Patty Duma asked me about the potential for Rempe to come back in the lineup just to provide a little bit of spark that the Rangers seem to be missing in Game 1 a spark that I think was stolen by the Panthers in that game. I thought they came out and kind of Uno reversed them and were able to take it that way. Um, I do think that would be overreacting a little bit, and I think it would be playing into the Panthers' hands. Although, we have seen out in Calgary, and we haven't seen it a ton with Florida, but you, you see the blasty jersey behind me if you're watching on YouTube right now. Um, you can get Kachuk out of his mind in the playoffs a little bit. And if Rempe is able to do that, then it does turn into advantage New York. But we've also seen Rempe isn't the most effective hockey player out there. And this Florida team is rather deep and their depth guys came to play in game one. So you, you can't afford to just lose minutes just for the vibes, man. So we will see how, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Also from a Rangers standpoint, I am expecting Shesterkin will probably be better in this game. Again, he wasn't the reason they lost. I just think he'll be better. Like, he he played a very good hockey game, but the two goals are on him. Um, he just whiffed on the Matthew Kachuk one, and then a bad turnover uh, leads to Verhage banking it in off of Lafreniere. He needs to be better in this game. I do think he will be better in this game. And for the Rangers offensively, they need to figure out the Florida Panthers' 
D zone coverage. They clogged things up so well in game one. The Rangers really couldn't establish a whole lot in the five on five or even on the penalty kill for, or, or on the power play. Sorry, for that matter. Uh, Florida's defensive game plan was exquisite. Um, Bobrovsky was good in game one, but you saw he was getting a little all over the place. I would expect the Rangers will be able to cause a little bit more chaos for him, and maybe that is where Rempe comes in. Um, but I would expect a little bit more chaos in front of Bobrovsky here in Game 2, and maybe causing a few more problems for him, and trying to open things up that way. But, like, for Florida, like, we talked about, like, game plan-wise, what the Rangers need to do. That's because Florida played damn near a perfect hockey game. So just... Control V or Control C, Control V, and move this one into to game two because I, I thought they were tremendous in this one. That this should be a really really fun game tonight. So that's the story from the National Hockey League. What about the Association? Uh, the Eastern Conference Final took a major hit last night. Let's talk about it. The Eastern Conference Final is now done with two games, and quite frankly, that could be the halfway point of this series after what happened last night. The big news from Game 2 between the Indiana Pacers and Boston Celtics is that Tyrese Halliburton is hurt. And if he is hurt for an extended period of time, then this series is over. Um, it's such a bummer because Halliburton was just getting back into it and just hitting his stride, and you could see that the joy he has in his game and the... The, the the skill that he can play with and how much that elevates everyone around him. That is, it's such a hit because he is so much fun to watch. And like I said, what was just starting to get it going. You did see Pascal Siakam step up last night, but if there's no Halliburton, like he just, he and the rest of these guys just can't keep up. Boston, I thought, had a much better game plan for game two going after Miles Turner. Um, Siakam still absolutely took advantage of them at times, and he's going to do that because he is still one of the more talented players in the NBA. Um, he's electric uh, as an offensive player, but as the number one focus for this very good Boston defense, it's going to be a bit of an issue going forward. So for the Pacers, like, it's quite simple. If there's no Halliburton, there's no series for them. And that this could end up being a sweep, um, if that is to, to be the case. I would expect the Pacers to come out guns blazing in Game 3 um, against the Pacers here, but we'll we'll see. Um, on the Boston side, once again, the Jays step up. And for Brown, it's another fantastic game. His scoring has been really impressive this series. Um, his shooting has been fantastic. His ability to get to the rim has been really, really, really good. Um, Boston has been able to get into the paint pretty much at will this entire series, and Brown has been been basically at the center of that for these games. And to, to me, he is hitting another level. Um, and look, it, it is not coming against the most resistance. While the Pacers are one of the more dynamic offensive teams we have seen in the NBA in quite some time, defensively, ugh, need some work. Um, and Boston is one of the better, again, offensive teams we've seen. So it's it's a tough matchup, but it, it is showing that Brown does have that other level to his game. And I, I have been so impressed. And look, I, I am not a member of the Jalen Brown fan club. I thought when Tatum was hurt in the the, the NBA Finals a couple years ago um, that he needed to step up, and he didn't. And I thought last year um, they needed Brown to step up, and he didn't. But now he is, and it, it's it's been really quite the thing to see. For Boston as well, you get Tatum now finding his stride in the second half. He, he really found out that he could get to his spot, which is that free throw line jumper, basically anytime he wanted to. And he did, and it, it really started to, to fall. And you think about it, the fact that he's basically had one good half in the first two games of this series, and they're up two zip, that is fantastic news for the Boston Celtics, and is really, really, really impressive. So, um, that this has been... This has been a, a really fun series, and I think for Tatum, there is a lot of criticism on him because they needed Brown to, to kind of bail them out in game one, um, and I'm not saying, oh, no, 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 everyone has it, I'll just back off, it's fine, but he is one of the few stars that at least seems like he is comfortable playing a secondary role if he needs to, and it's getting Brown going, Holiday has been going, White has played all right offensively as well, it, everyone else is kind of getting into a groove, and Tatum can kind of get his when he needs to get his. Now, that does 
the, the obvious exception to that is late in the game in game one, where they kind of needed him to step up, and again, it was Brown who was coming up with big shot after big shot. Um, but that's how this team is built. It's not just one guy going out there and getting it done. They have a few players who they trust. And uh, overall, I think people are being a bit too hard on the Celtics for a relatively easy path here to the Eastern Conference Final. Yes, th- this has not been the most resistance faced with Miami, Cleveland, and now Indiana. Um, the, the East, it, it turns out, like, with the injuries that we saw, again, to the Knicks, to the Celtic, or sorry, to the, the Bucks, and a little bit to the 76ers in MB trying to work his way back, um, all the top teams in the East just kind of crumbled around, and so it has been relatively smooth sailing for the Celtics so far. But I, I do think, like, when you look over at the West, who would you have favored over the Celtics? in the West playoffs. Like, Denver, probably. Um, As it's gone on, maybe Minnesota. That's probably it. Like, if Dallas ends up winning the the West final and um, Boston comes out of the East, the Celtics are going to be favored. And so, yeah, no, they have not been tested overly uh, so far in in this postseason. But part of that is just how damn good they are. And they've fallen asleep at the wheel a couple of times, and that's been very, very frustrating to watch. Um... But th- this is still one of the best teams in the league. And they're doing this with their own injury issues with um, Dingus Pingus, um, Kristaps Porzingis, on his way uh, back from an injury as well. So I think people need to chill on the Celtics. This is still legitimately one of the best teams in the NBA. All right, we haven't done this in a bit. Let's close with some baseball and specifically the Blue Jays. The Toronto Blue Jays uh, are hitting their stride, maybe, um, as they get ready for a uh, game tonight against the Detroit Tigers. Um, and for, first of all, Catlin Autocast has taken a bit of a break with all the playoff stuff and everything going on, but we'll be back at it uh, very, very soon. Uh, our weekly Toronto Blue Jays podcast here on the Couch Potato Diary Sports Network. Um, but the home run jacket's back, and with it, the home runs are back. Um, I, I just... I like seeing this team have fun. Um, for the last couple of years, like, Kiermaier is fun to watch. Um, Vlad, when he's going, it's obviously fun. Bo, the, the hair and all of that. But there hasn't been as much joy around this team. And so it's just great to have the jacket back and to have this team look like they're having fun again. And obviously the biggest part of what was lost when they traded Teoscar Hernandez and Lourdes Gurriel Jr. was the offense. Like, that, that was a big hit to this team. Um, but... Also, what was left, or what lost, sorry, what was lost, was a lot of personality with this group. And if you're going to be going out there for 162 games and playing this game and having all of us criticizing and asking why are you so bad, um, then it's going to wear on you. You may as well have some fun while you're out there. And so for this team to be able to have that fun again, to be able to have that joy again, is is just, it's great. And I, I don't think it's going to mean that this team makes the playoffs, but I do think it's able to get them back on track now. And I know it's been against the White Sox and the Tigers, but it's just nice to see them step up. I said on 960 today, I wasn't sure they could put up nine against the Bronx, uh, the, the Brooks Bombers, who the, the, the Okotoks Dogs are facing tonight, given how much this offense has struggled. So it's nice to see them step up, even against less or competition. Remember, we're not too far removed from the Washington Nationals uh, beating this team two out of three. They still need to make big moves to get this team into the playoffs. And that's something I want to remind people. This start has been bad. They are just three games out of a playoff spot. Playoff spot is not the end goal. Just because it's been bad to start this season doesn't mean the overall expectation of the organization, the overall urgency and desperation of this organization should change. This is still a team that the goal can't just be play two games in the wild card round and exit again. This team has to win playoff games. They have to win rounds if they are going to be able to, to kind of keep this thing together. And all the talk right now about the Blue Jays being open to trading Bo and being open to trade Vlad, if I am Rodgers right now, I'm not letting Atkins make those moves. This team either succeeds the way you have built it or someone else is going to come in and have to deal with those moves and, and blow it up because you, sir, are not good enough to, to run this baseball team anymore. So Atkins doesn't get to make those trades. They are either good enough with those guys or they're not and he is fired and we try to find someone else who can either build around them or send those guys packing. In terms of the Blue Jays today, Alec Manoa gets the start. The bounce back the last couple of games has been really nice and just overall for the Blue Jays, getting that positive momentum going has been a 
whole lot of fun to see. All right, that's going to do it for the show today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. As I mentioned before, part two is going to be coming out um, a Fighting Friday. We're going to look at fights to make after Usyk against Fury. We are going to be looking at uh, King of the Ring preview and an AEW Double or Nothing preview. Uh, if you're watching this uh, basically as soon as it comes out, I am on Home Team Live tonight calling the Okotoks dogs tonight and tomorrow. Check me out there. Um, and that's it. If you're watching, make sure you like and subscribe. Leave a comment. If you're listening, make sure you subscribe and leave a review. Follow me on social media. I am at Primetime Klein, and that is going to do it. Thank you guys so much, and I'll talk to you all later. I'm out.